um, originally this this was titled um, moving DB2 data using ADF. Um, I've since changed it to moving on-prem database on-prem an on-prem database using ADF with ODBC. And the reason I did that actually was because my DB2 crashed um, about three days ago before this presentation. And it had me kind of freaking out. I couldn't get it fixed. But the cool thing is you guys are going to get the benefit of my headache. <laughs> so on we go. Um, just a brief agenda, not a whole lot of slides, like I said. Um, we'll go through a little bit of an introduction about what Data Factory is, um, an architectural overview, and then we'll do a demo and some Q&A. So um, to begin with, first of all, um, what is Data Factory? Well, um, Data Factory is a service that um, Microsoft has built in the cloud that allows us to um, build data movement without having to code. That's in a nutshell, that's basically what it is. Um, it encapsulates everything you need from error trapping to um, logic flow to iteration looping, all of that in one environment. Um, in addition, you can have your events trigger based on a schedule, i.e. a daily or hourly or you know every few minutes schedule, or you can even have it um, fire off based on activities that happen in the cloud. Uh, someone drops a file in a, um, a folder, boom, you can go off. Now, that only happens in the cloud. Um, if something drops in a file in a on-prem, you're not gonna get a notification. So don't think you can use the same principles in both sides. This is a typical um, ADF art, um, architecture I've used a bunch of times at different places. Um, this one's kind of gotten a lot of pieces pulled out that you know are specific, and oftentimes we'll add something specific that helps with the specific environment we're in. But the concept is that when you have an ADF environment, you'll have some on-premises data that you may wanna get in. And in order to do that, you need a few components. Um, obviously, you need the database that it's running from. And in this case, I show you, you could, you know, we could use DB2 or SQL. And both of them would talk to what's called an integration runtime. An integration runtime is only a, a little piece of software Microsoft puts out that allows the ADF um, system to, sorry about that. Oh, geez, no, it sounds my phone too long. Right? Um, <clears throat> uh, integration runtime is a way of, um, a piece of software Microsoft will install. Um, you can install it manually or use their express client. I'll show you um, a little bit of both ways. Um, but the basic concept is that it, encapsulates all of the data transfer to the cloud to the specific pipeline that you've set up. So it's not like just going out into the cloud and who knows where. There's a, a, a key authentication that occurs between the two and it encrypts everything, pushing it up into the cloud. Um, a common practice is take everything that you get out of your database, and this is a common practice in even outside the cloud. Um, it's extract, transform, load, right? Well, extract the blob, dump it into a blob storage, so that connectivity is not being tasked through the entire process, right? Then you take that blob storage data, load it up into some place in SQL. Um, typically our pattern uses, put it into a staging environment. There's a couple of reasons for that. One, it guarantees that you now have data in your, um, in your environment that's in a SQL um, or, or queryable environment and you've conformed to whatever um, requirements there are from that data. Um, that's the first thing. But the major thing is obviously that you, you know, you may have um, some tables you're going to copy everything in and other tables you're going to only copy the new transactions in. Well, you dump them into a staging area and then you can load them into your table once you've gotten them into the staging area. Um, you, you know, you don't want to endanger your, your final target, which is probably your production server, where somebody might need that, that data and you, while you're trying to move it in, you could have you know, caused the problem. So we load it into staging, then from staging, we'll, we'll load it into the target. Um, and you'll notice that in this environment, there's a, a data factory logo that shows that. And basically that's what the data factory is operating on when it's doing those things. Along the way, uh, one thing that's, that data factory doesn't do, um, and I'm not gonna really get into in this, um, this webinar, I, I showed it in another webinar, but um, is using what's called logic apps. 
um, data factory doesn't have a notification methodology that says I know sorry I know how to to send alerts so a method for doing alerts or notifications of status or errors or whatnot is to use a logic app um, and that's a fairly simple thing to do but you do have to set up a logic app that knows how to handle that and that, we're not going to get into that here but that's part of the architecture okay so on to the demo Let's see here um, so basically um, in my Azure environment um, I've got two pipelines I've created now I was going to walk through the whole thing actually it took about it'll take about a half an hour for me to prep my environment I'm not gonna bother with that um, it would just show you the steps and you'll figure this out as we go um, it would have been nice to go from the from the get-go I will go from the beginning on a pipeline just so you can see but we won't go through the in integration runtime in the same way we had. So um, we can start with that and I'll show you how the integration runtime starts. Um, so to begin with, I'm gonna open up a whole new data factory just so you can see how you start from fresh because honestly, if you've never done it, that could be a little confusing and it's not gonna look like what we're gonna do the rest of the way. So I'm gonna go to my home, I'm gonna say I wanna create a new resource and I'm gonna create a new data factory. So when you create a data factory, that okay. um, it'll pop up and it'll ask you to give it a name and I'll call it demo just for the time being because we're not, we can't use demo, I've already used it, I guess. Um, and you pick a resource group. Um, in case you're not you know, sure what resource group, what I tend to do with resource groups is if I'm gonna do something that like in this case, a demo, I'll put it in a resource group that I know I can delete everything out of when I'm done. So I'm not wasting my, my um, Azure dollars on something I'm not using that I created and I forgot about, because I have done that before. So I typically, it will, if it's a new thing and I'm just fooling around, I'll create a resource group. If I'm gonna keep it, then I put it into a, a, a specific resource group that manage, matters to that. You also need to pick the location. You probably want the location to be closest to your data. Um, I live in East US, so I always pick East US. Um, and then you can set up Git. I'm not going to go through Git here because that's a whole nother session. Um, and then you just go ahead and validate it and it'll go ahead and start to create it. It takes a little time for it to create it. Um, while it's deploying, um, I'll show you an already deployed um, uh, data factory so we can work in that. But I, I will come back to this so you can see what an empty data factory looks like so you don't get kind of confused from that. So in data factory what the first thing you're going to need to do if you want to get any data is establish connections now you can see we have a few connections already set up and i'll walk through how we set those up but before that basically you need to be able to connect to some resources and in order to connect to some resources you're going to need an integration runtime now the data factory automatically installs with what's called an auto resolve integration runtime Azure puts that up for you it's running and it knows how to talk to Azure things so if all you're going to do is work within the Azure environment you don't need a second integration runtime but if you have on-premises data you're going to need a, an integration runtime and in order to set up an integration runtime there's a whole process you go through so I'm going to show you what this one looks like um, we're not going to go through the full setup because you don't really need to see that at this point. And I've only got one laptop to do this on. The install, like I said, takes about you know half an hour between from uninstall to in and install. So not worth wasting the time. Um, but there are two choices, and I'll explain how they work real quick. One is you click on the launch the express setup for this computer. It'll download everything, walk through every step for you, and install it. And you really don't have to do anything. And when it's done, it'll be running. Now, that's perfect for setting up um, on your local box or on the box you're running from. If you happen to be trying to set this up on, say, a VM in another environment, that's not so good, right? Because you have to be on the box and you have to, this, this will only download to the current um, box. Another way is to do the manual setup, which would be download and install it. And it's a very simple download, like a normal Microsoft install. You download the, the, um, the file, install, 
as you're going through the install, you'll come to a section where it says, okay, now you need to register an authentication key. And what it'll ask you for is this one of these authentication keys. If you click on this little box here, copy to clipboard, you'll get a copy of that key. You'll paste it in. There's a register button, you'll register. It'll take a few minutes while it's syncing up with that key and it'll find that it's got a connection. Now, another aspect of integration runtime I'm not gonna cover, but you may be interested in is that you can have multiple nodes. And the purpose for this, in this case, this is all for demo, so we're not concerned about being um, able to have any kind of high availability. But if we were in an environment where we were in a production or even a development environment where we had a lot of data moving, um, you, you probably want to have multiple nodes in case something goes wrong with one of them, you can always get to your data. And this will handle, you know, moving data back and forth seamlessly between them. And all you do is you're going to do the same installation on two different VMs, basically. Same process, it knows how to link them together and you'll end up seeing two nodes here instead of one. That's how that'll end up working. Um, it's it's re relatively easy and straightforward to set up. Um, one bit of confusion you may run into, and I, I'm kind of surprised I don't, you know, I've never found anything on this. If you notice they have a, an ability for you to recycle your key here, if you click on this, this is a recycle button, and you know, there are two keys. Well, um, there's no way to apply a new key to integration runtime. You have to uninstall and reinstall, which is why I can't demo this to you because you have to literally Disconnect it. When you do go to uninstall it, though, if you do find yourself in a situation where you need a new key or something got messed up and you want to do this again, you'll be given an option that says, do you want to save your settings or do you want to wipe them out and start over? You, you want to answer that you, you want to erase all your settings. You want to do a complete uninstall. Because what will happen is if you don't do that, then the key gets kept on your install and it will try to just upgrade your or, or put a fresh install of the integration runtime on your box with that key and not allow you to change it. So if you need to change your key for whatever reason, say you, you started a whole new data factory, one data factory, one integration runtime. An integration runtime cannot be shared by another data factory. So that's another issue. So whenever you're changing this, just rem remember you got to uninstall and reinstall. And that's enough said. So that's how integration runtime works. Once it's set up, then you can add in linked services. And let's go back over to see if my, yes, my deployment is complete. So now I can show you what a, a, a started data factory will look like. So this is what an empty data factory would look like within Azure. Now, one thing that's different about data factory from the rest of Azure is it always, if you wanna do any work in your data factory, it's always gonna open up a new window. The new window is gonna to point to adf.portal.com and, or adf.azure.com, sorry. Um, and it's gonna have this new development environment just for the factory. So it doesn't talk, it's, it knows about your Azure stuff, but it's a different window and it works somewhat differently. And when you first load it up, it's basically just gonna show you an introduction to data factory and have some wizards for you to, to choose from if you wanna start a new data factory. So what, and typically that loads up a lot faster than it is. Not sure why we're not getting any, oh, there we go. So you'll see this thing that says, let's get started. And you'll never see that again. Oops. You'll never, you'll never see this at this screen once you get something in your data factory built you know, a pipeline of any kind. Once there's a pipeline, then it knows you know how to create a pipeline. But, you know, this is gonna let you create a pipeline, create a, a data flow, create a pipeline from a template, all of these different things. Um, and if you look on the left-hand side, you'll see that there are these three icons. One is the home, that brings you back to here. Then the other is one for author and one for moniker. You'll do most of your work in author. And basically, um, you come into author and when you come in just blank, as you can see, it says, you need to add something. You need to do something, right? Um, so, you know, in this case, I, I, I think I clicked on the, um, 
the button for add a new data flow. But if you came here and you just said, let me go back to home, and you just said create a pipeline, you get a blank pipeline. And either way you're doing it, you're still going to need, you'll notice there's no integration runtime setup except for the default integration runtime. So I'd still need to go through and install my integration runtime. And if we tried to do it here, this, this pipeline can't connect to the integration runtime that's already out there. Not as long as it's connected to another pipeline. Once you have, or the factory, I should say, once you have a factory connected to a pipeline, that's the only factory that can use it. So I can't now reuse my pipeline. So I'm not even going to bother. We're not going to go back into this, and I'm not going to walk through the rest of this demo. I just wanted to show you what the empty um, um, data factory would look like. So now, if you recall on our architecture, which I can show you, pull back to our slides here. Let's see. Maybe not. Sorry, I, I I really am befuddled by it. It's starting earlier than I expected, and I, my my windows aren't set up. But if we go back and you know, if you remember, we had a blob storage, we had a connection to ODBC, and we had a SQL Server. Well, that's what's represented here. You can see this is the blob storage account, and I'll show you how this is set up. Um, basically, um, actually, I'm going to create a new one just so you can see because they're easy to create. So you want to create a new one? You go to new. <coughs> And the first thing we're going to go and do is create a blob storage location, right? So we go ahead and say we want to create a blob storage um, setup. Obviously, you're going to need a blob storage account. So, I, you know, I've got one already set up. It'll default to blob storage too. You know, I recommend if you're going to use multiple um, link services, use them for a purpose. And there will be needs for that. And we'll get into that in, um, in a little bit. But more often, that goes to data sets. So pick your name for your, your storage as it applies. In this case, I'm just going to leave it at the default. Um, you can pick your um, integration runtime that's on premises if you're if you if it has the ability to uh, manage storage. But that's more for like if you had file storage, you wouldn't really use it for blob storage. Let's say you wanted to read from files on a local box, you can do that. Um, but it, you don't use the blob storage, but it would be a similar thing. In this case, we're just going to use the auto resolve integration runtime and we're going to pick the appropriate subscription. It wants to know which subscription are you going to get your account for blob storage and then which account are you going to use? And so I'm going to use my webinar blob storage account and just go ahead and create it. And this will create a whole, and that's, that's this, that's probably the easiest one you can create, right? Um, it's not very difficult because there's not a lot of options to it. Um, the trickier ones are the ODBC, but before we get into that, I'll show you how to create a link service to SQL in Azure. So I've got an Azure server set up, a, um, a SQL database. So I click on Azure SQL database as my link service. Again, it's going to offer me the, the default name. Um, again, I, I have to choose my integration runtime, and in this case, because it's an Azure device, I'm going to use my auto resolve integration runtime. Now I pick my subscription. Again, I'm I'm going to have to um, now now after I pick my subscription, it knows which servers are in which subscription. So if I pick my paper my, my page to go subscription, it would only list the ones in there. But in this case, um, I can pick my webinar server and my database that's in there. Oh, I had a database in there. Maybe I don't. Maybe it's a different one. Yeah, that was my webinar. That's what it's called. Um, and then I key in my my authentication. And hold on a second. Let me pull that up here. I think this is it, but I'm not sure. I've got two credentials I've got to use. So, but the way you can tell is you key in your ID, and the very whenever you're setting up a database or an ODBC connection, it's really kind of important that you test it. 
because if it doesn't pass, <laughs> you're not getting anywhere. But if you do get a, a, a successful connection, you'll see something like this. For example, if I were to put in the wrong password and test it, it'll come back and it'll give me a fail. When you get a fail, this little more box will show you what the, what the um, error was. Now, in this case, um, it's saying something about make sure SQL database allows integration runtime access to the user. It's not saying it's the wrong password. <laughs> and this is wonderful about some of these error messages. You're not likely to see an error message that, that really makes sense to you, but after a while you might kind of figure it out or you can Google them. And Google will become your friend with those error messages, I, I can tell you that. So I'm not gonna continue to create this because I've already um, got one out there and we don't need two of them. Uh, but I wanted to walk you through that. Now I'm gonna walk you through creating an ODBC and these are a little different, well, no, they are a lot different. Um, but there's some tricks to them and you will you can run into some problems I ran into some and as a matter of fact the problem I ran into recently um, Trying to create an ODBC connection to my DB2. So um, let's say ODBC1 DB2 And I'm going to use my Integration runtime and now the way this works is you put in your connection string and it's not a complex one like you do when you're trying to do um something like an OADB one where you have to put the provider and everything else. In this case, on my machine, I've got a connection string and I'm gonna show you my um, data sources on my machine. And you can see that I have um, something called web and web32. They're both pointing to a SQL server, right? There are ODBC connections to them, so I have one version that looks at it from 64-bit and one that looks at it from 32-bit. And that's that's important. You need to know which one's going to work. And I actually had to play with it to get the right one to work here. So the way you set this up is the DSN will say DSN equal and then the name. We'll, we'll first hit the 32 and then we'll, we'll hit the, the 64. So DSN and then my authorization or my my account information is uh, let's see okay And you can see we're testing and I think this one doesn't work yet. So this one says it doesn't work and you'll notice this error, this IM014 error. When you see this, this is basically telling you that there's a, a disconnect between the application and the driver. The driver is one um, style and the application is looking for another. In this case, it's looking for the 64-bit driver and I'm using the 32-bit driver. It knows it can get there, but it says, guys, we're not talking at the right rate, so this isn't gonna work. Your word size and my word size aren't the same. We gotta fix this. So that's basically what this message means. Now you can't change how, if you Google this, you'll probably be told, change your application to call with the right driver. Well, you can't change how Azure's gonna call. It's gonna use 64, 32, depending upon what it knows. And honestly, I don't know how it determines that, because I've seen it use both. Um, didn't mean to say that. Um, but the way you fix it is you make sure there's a 32, uh, 64 bit as well, or the alternate bit if one doesn't work. And if you recall, the 64 bit was just called web, right? So I'm gonna now go ahead and connect to web or try to connect to web and connection successful. So when you see that message, and to be honest with you, when I saw that message on my machine initially, it turned out that on my DB2 box, I needed a, a PTF or program, program temporary fix from IBM to allow me to connect at 64 bit. They didn't have that, that working properly and that's why I was getting an error. So that's why I thought my DB2 system wasn't working and I kind of built this around working from my SQL server. Either way it will work. Once you get your ODBC connection, it's just like talking to any other data device. So that's basically all you have to do to get that working. I'm not gonna save this either because we already have one. Um, but that's what you would do for either one of these. In both cases, I had to make sure that my connection string matched. Now, after you set it up, one thing to remember, 
remember your connection string string because you can't see it again. If you notice right now, it's all um, obscured. This is a security method to help, kind of help protect you. Well, if you don't remember and you had to do some changes, you're not going to be able to change it. Um, this bit me early on in my ADF world. Um, somebody set up the connection for me and then they left the company and I didn't know what they did. It took me a while to figure this one out. So word to the wise, Make sure you know what your connection string is that you use. And you can also add options. Um, uh, for example, when I hit DB2 on an IBM I, I'll turn off auto commit. Um, it'll be um, an option that's it's, um, just, you know, a string that they have called auto commit equal off. And I, you know, but, you know, if you have other settings you need to pass, that's something you'll want in your connection string and you can pass it in. So that's setting up your link service. Now we'll go to how you move this data now that we've seen what link services look like, right? Well, before you can do anything, you kind of need some data sets because all that did is said, now at my data factory can talk to these devices. It knows how to communicate to them. It doesn't actually have a way to process data within them. That's done with a data set. And I've got a few data sets set up here. Uh, we'll start out with my ODB SQL. Um, so to create a new data set, um, basic, well, actually, I'll, I'll show you create a new one. That'll be easier. New data set. And again, you'll see similar icons, right, that we got when we were doing link services. You're seeing that, okay, now if I want to connect to a, a blob storage, I'm going to need a data set to get the blob storage. If I want to go to an Azure SQL, well, then I have to pick Azure SQL. So we'll work on that one. We're not going to go through each one like we did the other because it, it's kind of once you've done one, you, they're all the same. You're going to pick the link service that we just created. And then you can specify a table. And if you know that you're moving, let's say you want to move one table. And in this case, let's say we want to move just the products table. Then I can say, OK, that's the, that's the data set I've now identified. You can also leave the table empty and specify it at, at execution time. And if you do that, then, you know, it could be, you know, when you, you either pass in a parameter or you have some process that knows how to pass in the value. But in this case, we're gonna just say, we know the table, we wanna move it. And that's how you would set that up. And oh, by the way, that's pretty much what we did with our ODBC SQL. So I'm not gonna save this, but that's all it takes to set it up. And again, now you don't have to test because your connection's already there, right? But one thing that is kind of cool is um, you'll notice that once it once you create, you'll come to a, a dialogue like this. You can do a thing called preview data. And if you click on preview data, you'll get to see it'll go out to that database. It'll make a connection and it'll pull, pull back some sample data for you. Um, typically, I think it's 50 rows it pulls back and you get to see what's in that data. And it also kind of proves that the connection's working and all of that, and you're seeing what you expected. And here's my product database, and you can see, yeah, it looks like what I expected. So that's good to know. I know that it's good stuff. Um, whenever you see that preview data, bear in mind that that's something you can use for alternate things as well. And we'll get into that in a little bit. So that's my ODBC connection. And now I have a data set that comes out of ODBC, and it will present the products to me. So how am I going to use that? Well, um, if you go in and we'll, we'll start a new pipeline. I've got a couple I'll show you that are already done, but I'm gonna create a brand new pipeline so you can get to see what it looks like. And when you start a pipeline, you, you start with this very basic empty um, environment with some activities you can perform. And the, the activities range from within move, you've got a copy data and a data flow. Um, data Explorer is new, I haven't done anything with it. Um, you can, you can write an Azure function that you can use to process something. Um, you can process a um, um, batch services, and you can use Databricks. We're not going to get into a lot of this right now. We're going to do, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to do a copy data, just your basic, very simple operation um, within um, ADF. You, you drag the copy data onto the panel, and now you can um, make, make changes. Now, bear in mind that when you're in here, there's two modes, right? Now that it is not selected, I am working on the pipeline. This is, you can see I have the name pipeline one here, and it's all about the pipeline. So I'm gonna change the name. And I typically like to do this 
um, because I, that gives me the, the understanding of what's in that pipeline. Um, you'll end up with a lot of them, I think. Um, when you select on here, now you'll notice that now I'm looking at a different object. So if you get confused, why am I seeing these options? Uh -oh, what's that mean? That's what it is. Where are you selected? Or why can't I see what I want? Well, maybe you don't have it selected yet. Well, when I added the copy data, right away, you see a little red thing says it's not complete. That's what this little red circle means. And then you can see over here, there are two required values that have not been filled in. And that's what that means. One required value over here and one required value over here. If there were multiple values, it would list two and one or something like that. So over here, it's asking me, well, what the, what's your source? Where are you getting this data from? So the first place I'm going to get this data from is my my um, SQL, my ODBC SQL, right? I'm going to go out there and I'm going to pull that data out of that data set I just connected to, which was the products data, data set, which again, if we pre preview the data here, we'll see it show up as the products data set. Well, now I've got it connected in a copy data statement. So the next step will be we go to sync and I'm pulling it. I need to put it somewhere. Well, I'm going to put it in blob storage. And when you say you want to put it in blob storage, here's my preview. Same data. When you say you want to put it in blob storage, um, it's basically going to dump it into that blob storage. I do want to actually that that reminded me and I, and I apologize. I was going to build each of these on the on the way new. But it would have required that uninstall I mentioned earlier, so I'm not, I would, didn't do that. But I do have to go back and show you something else in my connections because it is kind of important that I show you one thing in Blob Storage that I didn't when I was um, building it. When you're creating the Blob Storage account or uh, connection, um, there's a, a option. Oh no, it's not there. It's on the data set. I'm sorry. When you create the data set, discard. I'll go to data sets again and create a new data set. There is an option that you have to pick. And if you forget to pick it, you'll bang into it. After you select blob, blob storage, it's going to ask you, well, what did you put in the blob storage? And in this case, we're using um, delimited text files. So when you go to a delimited text file, now there'll be some options. First, you got to pick the link server that you want. So. That is the link service. You can tell it what path to connect to and you can browse to that. Um, but the, the key you want to look out for is this first row as header. You want to check that off, otherwise it's going to process a header row as data and you don't want it to do that, right? And then it won't know how to get the column names. Um, if, you, if you check this, it will know that. So that's a critical thing you need to do. Um, and if you don't, you'll end up having some issues. So bear that in mind. So I'm going to come back over to my pipeline here, my demo pipeline. Oops, sorry. So um, I, I've said my, my sync is the limited text. So now I've got it ready to go, right? I've got, I've populated it with my source. I've populated it with my sync. I can set up mapping, but honestly, I've never done it. I just accept the auto mapping. Um, I've never had a need to map some columns to a table and not all of them. Um, so, that, you know, that's pretty straightforward. So I can go ahead and debug this now. I can say debug and it'll go ahead and start to push that. And, and that's a, a handy way to see, well, what's going on? Did I get my data? Is it moving? And you'll notice that automatically it starts to run and it changes my bottom window to my output parameter. And you can see currently it's running. It's queued up and it's wanting to run. Oh, got done, it's successful. Well, um, when you look over here, you'll notice that I have two, two dialogues. One is what's the input that went in and it shows me where it was going and what it was doing. And then it'll show me what the output was. And you know, it says that it read so many bytes of data, it wrote so many bytes of data, so on and so forth. And you know, that, this information, especially when something goes wrong, is very valuable because you can see what, what you got. While it's processing, if this had taken a while, you could even click on the eyeglasses and watch it move. And it'll, this dialog will sit up here and show you as it's moving data. So that's another handy feature with the um, copy data. So that's basically all it took to get that data out of my on-prem box 
into the Azure environment, and now it's sitting in a blob storage. Not a whole lot of usefulness to it there, but it is there. Um, so this is a very similar pipeline with a second step. The second copy data step now says its source is, guess what, the delimited text, right? It's going against the delimited text, and then it's going to sync with my Azure SQL DB. And when it syncs with my Azure SQL DB, that data in my products table. So again, I, I'm pulling from, I, I, and by the way, um, just so you know, and I'll pull up my um, SQL Server so you can see my I have in my, in my demo data, I have these tables, right? These are the tables that are out there and I do have a products table. And right now it's got data in it. So I can say, And I've got data, right? Um, I can also delete from there. And now the table's empty. So we know it's empty. And when I run that job, when I run this, it should populate it. Now I did notice when, when I started it up, I had a little error. I was tweaking with this. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and hit preview data and see whether we still have an error or no. Okay. That was, I'd, I'd done some things to move it around and, and add another data set and that caused that error, but I cleaned it up and I thought I did. Um, nothing like a demo to get you, get things working in, incorrectly. So again, I'm tri triggering it off. Now you can see I have my output window again, and it's showing me that it's got a cute thing. This, by the way, this little refresh button will, it will automatically refresh, I think every 30 seconds, but if you click it, it'll refresh it for you. Oh, and it failed. So um, that's good because that means there's something I can show you how to fix a bug. And I, I was hoping we would get an error so we could see that. Oop, I didn't mean to do that. I need to find that bug. So when you get a bug, you'll notice again, we have the input. It, it, in this case, this input is saying, you know, it shows you select from the source and it's going to the, the, um, the limited text sync. So that's the first step that died right? The one that worked earlier, but it was on a different pipeline. Now I look at my error code and not as, not too readable there, but if I open it up, you can see that it says, uh, let's see, the object name product. Oh, I did rename my table and see, I got burnt because I renamed my table on my source. Um, so I'm going to have to go in here and the simple fix to that will be come over here and let's see. The source, I think, is where it was. Yeah, from product. See, it says in here, um, select star from product. And I can say select star from product. Now, the reason I did this on, if you recall, um, if I just used the table, this is looking at the preview data. And that's what it originally did. And I, I actually ended up tweaking this. So I apologize for that. That was a tweak I'm, I, I was going to take out and put in and show you how you could do. And that's why this is here. But if it had just said table, it would look for the table to be there. Now, if the table wasn't specified, I'd be in trouble, right? But the table is specified, so it'll work. So, or it should work. Famous last words. As you can see, we're queued up again. And this should run relatively quickly. Yep, sure enough, copy data one already succeeded. And copy data two is now queued up. And that should probably be done within a second or two. Oh, so it, it failed. Again, another condition, probably something I, grew, I screwed around with while I was trying to set up the other pipeline to show you.
Oh, okay. So yeah, this was, I changed this to, to use for the dynamic pipeline um, that I had set up. So rather than changing this, I'm gonna show you creating a new data set so that I don't have to alter that one. So I'm gonna say, add a new data set, and we're gonna to point to, again, Azure SQL DB, just so you can see, because I do wanna show you the dynamic pipeline when we, just before we finish up. And this will only take a second. Okay, so now we come back over to our two-step pipeline and change it to use this one. And now we say debug. And it's queued up. While this is running, I'm gonna show you the dynamic pipeline real quick. So basically in my dynamic pipeline, which is, a, you know, again, another pipeline, um, basically, what this one is doing is first it's doing a lookup, which is calling to a stored proc I have that will that says get me all the details about a table about the table you want to move. And basically, what it's going to do is pass the source name, the target name, and any schema information it needs to to use to to map that data. Right. So now I can have a whole set of data. And if you look at my um, SQL environment over here. What I've got is there are two sets of data. This this set is my full load, and then I've got it also set up for incremental load. So we've got a whole system that manages. Um, and if you look at these tables over here, you got blob types, incremental config, and source to target config. These tables control the mapping. Basically, you got your source schema, your blob name that you're going to use, your stage schema, your target schema, and oh by the way, um, the reason I use these different schema names is. In, the, um, in one of the environments we ended up working in, we found that we had a customer wanted to merge disparate systems together. And by using targeted schema names that referenced where they came from, it was easy for them to identify how the data got sourced. So that's just a, a thing we ended up adopting. And we found it useful, even if it's not, if it's a homogenous environment and we're not trying to combine anything. But that's that's basically what those principles are. And if anybody wants further information about this configuration, I'd be willing to share this. Um, this is all stuff I don't mind putting out in the public. Um, it's just something that I got from someone else and tweaked it myself. So I'd be glad to share this code with anybody. Um, we'll come back here and see how did we do on our output. Oh wait, this one is in that. There we go. Our output. Oh look, it succeeded. So. Um, things loaded. So now I should be able to come back over here and see if I have my data. Don't want to delete again, that's for sure. And sure enough, the data got loaded. So you can see that the process worked and that's a pretty straightforward methodology to, to get data moving. But like I said, the dynamic pipeline, this will allow me to get back multiple results. Then from those results, I, I then call this for each loop. The for each loop says, and it's got some basic settings, they're not that complex, but it's a little tricky because you have to know that I want, and by the way, this is something that happens in ADF. I haven't, you haven't seen me use it yet, but sometimes you'll pop up and it'll even say Alt P for dynamic contents. Other times it requires you to use dynamic contents. And it, the way this dynamic content works is it all starts with the at sign, at and then something. Um, if I was to say, put in the data factory name, it would be at pipeline data factory name. That's how it would go. Matter of fact, I'm going to clear the clear the content, clear it, and then if I put this in, it knows to do that. It, you'll notice though, if I put in a second item, it doesn't add the at sign. You only need one at sign. So clear the contents again. Now you can also scroll down, and any activities that have output you can you can look at. Now obviously if the activity hasn't occurred they're not going to the output's not going to do you any good. In this case this activity is upstream so I can reference the lookup activity and I can say I want the value out of the lookup activity. So I go for output out and the and this syntax it's not easy to figure out. I mean it's not like documented here that you would think but it's just output.value 
I wish some of this documentation would have been a little bit more clear. Well, now this for reach loop is kind of like its own little pipeline, right? So if I double click on it, I can pull up what's going on in here. And you'll see that in here, one of the first things I do in every for each loop I do is I, I set up a variable just so I can see what that I am processing the rows the way I thought I was. So before I start moving any data or doing any activities behind the scenes, I want to see that my for each loop is getting the each item it expected. And that's basically all the set variable is doing. It's set, pushing the table name into, the, into it so that I can see it. That's all that I've ended up doing. But now you'll notice that on the copy data, instead of my having my um, source and sync set up the same way, I'm passing in values. If you notice, this is my source. So now I'm selecting from ODBC. I'm using a query, but my query doesn't say products. It says something called item, parenthesis, source schema, item table, and concat. Well, how did I get that? Again, come over here. I come into to my dynamic content, and this is another little um, nuance of ADF. If you want to string things together, you got to use the concat function. So I'm concatenating the words, select star from, and then the name of the source schema, and then a, a period, and then the table name. So this is now going to take from that lookup that got back a set of data, the value for each iteration it did, and process it with the, with this statement. So um, if we look at my D, my my selection over here, that call is analogous to this call here. So these three rows are what came back in that call. So any any value here that I have, I can use. So I'm using the table name and the source schema here to get it. Okay. Then I come over to the next step and the sync side. It's a similar set situation. Now, instead of I don't need the table name, what I need is the blob folder name and the blob file name. To get this to pass in, one of the things I had to do was I had to set up another data source. This data source, when I set it up, if you look at this data source, we go to the data source, you'll notice that coming over here, the connection looks similar, but over here I have parameters. I set up the parameters so that it knows to accept the value that it can use. Right? And then I can use those values over here as something that came in. And once you give it a parameter, then you can say, out of the data set, give me, and it'll, if you look over here, when I wanted to set this up, I could say I wanted data folder, and it's, it'll add in the word data set for me. So that's basically how easy it is to get that parameter in. But it now will, it will require it to be passed in, right? So you've got to fill it in. So this, back over on this um, dynamic pipeline, this is looking for two new values that weren't on the other pipelines, if you recall. And those are those parameters. That's where they come from. So now I'm going to pass for each iteration. They're going to, we're going to copy some data. And we'll get the data for customer. We'll get the data for supplier. And we'll get the data for, for product. And I'm sorry I'm going so fast. I really was hoping to have been able to get through this a little bit more smoothly. So then the next step is similar to the other copy we had, only now our source is going to use from the from the, the blob storage, the same thing, blob folder, blob name, nice and easy, right? And we're going to go to the sync of my Azure SQL table with parameters. And again, we set up a parameter on that data set so I could pass in the source schema and the, um, the table name. Probably should have passed in the target schema here, honestly. Um, they're both the same, so it didn't hurt me here, but that would have been more accurate. So that's basically all that's necessary to do that. Now, I do want to show you one thing. Um, go back over to the source real quick. If you want to do a preview data here, you still can, but it's going to ask you, well, I got parameters. You got to tell me the parameters. So this is a way to test that your parameters are working properly, right? So you can always fill in your parameters. Now, I'm not going to bother with that because we're just about out of time, and I want to leave some time for some questions and answers. So, with that in mind, that's basically all I have for content. Does anybody have any questions? No questions? Well, then, thank you for your time. Thank you for your patience with my showing up a little late. Um, I hope you all learned something. And if you have any questions, um, you can contact me. 
Um, I do have on my, let me pull up my PowerPoint again. I do have a slide that has my contact information on it, I believe. No, I forgot to. No, no but I did find this little interesting, this was supposed to be my thank you closing slide. Um, just, I thought that was funny and I hoped you would. German Wi-Fi is the worst and they show <laughs> the worst. I was stationed in Germany in the army, so I have a, I have a heart for German worst. I love it. That's it. All right, thank you so much, Tom. We really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to host this webinar. Um, as for everybody else, if you guys have questions about the webinar um, and when you get when you can receive the recording, you will receive that recording at noon in your email box. So please look out for that. And if you have any questions about this webinar or DBA Managed Services, please feel free to reach out to myself or Tom, and thank you guys so much for attending. Um, for everyone else, if you guys haven't followed us on social media, please feel free to follow us on Twitter at Pragmatic Works, as well as our YouTube, where you can find our past webinars under Pragmatic Works as well. Um, thank you guys so much, and we hope to see you guys in the next webinar. Have a great rest of your Tuesday.